Welcome to the SEI Podcast Series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the SEI podcast series. My name is Rachel Dezonbach. I'm the Digital Transformation Lead at SEI's Emerging Technology Center. And today, I'm so excited to be joined by my colleague, Jay Palat, to have a discussion about AI workforce development. Welcome, Jay. Good morning, Rachel. Good to be here. Excited to have this discussion. So why don't we start off by telling our audience a little bit about ourselves and the work that we do here at the SEI. And I, I can start with that as a means of jumping in. So my background is in engineering systems and human-centered design. And before joining the SEI, I was an innovation fellow and on the faculty at UC Berkeley, where I helped to grow and define the field of development engineering. Here at the SEI, I'm helping our partners to think about what is needed from an organizational standpoint to adopt new technologies. What, what does that really look like? What needs to be in place for organizations to bring new technologies in, as well as helping to lead our AI engineering efforts. I'm Jay Pallott. I'm a senior engineer at the SEI. I've been in the industry for about 20 years doing a variety of roles, uh, leading companies uh, at the at the Fortune 500 level all the way down to alpha level startups. Um, my goal is to help build things and help uh, it, it create better technologies. And at the SEI, I am helping to build uh, AI products. Great. Thanks so much, Jay. And you know, today we're going to have a conversation about workforce development, and I think it's going to hit on both of our backgrounds, kind of pulling in what is happening in industry, what's happening in the education sector, and how do we bring those together to really support this work of AI engineering that we find important. And don't worry, we'll, we'll, I'm sure we will get to defining AI engineering a little bit later in our conversation. So Let's start our conversation today with something that's front of mind for many. So recently, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence released this major report, you know, the work of several years that was focused on many different aspects about the adoption of artificial intelligence, but a big piece of it was workforce. And they talked about how there's a gap right now in the, the workforce in the government to really support AI and AI adoption efforts. And so why don't we start off by talking a little bit about AI workforce development, both in government and industry. And Jay, maybe you can start us off by talking a little bit about the trends you're seeing as industry is trying to adopt AI. Sure. So. Where we are right now is uh, there's been an explosion of people trying to build new capabilities with AI. We've seen a lot of really interesting innovations coming out of academia and then moved into industry and being adopted in a radical way. So we have large companies, uh, the unicorns, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts, building AI first businesses that are leveraging the enormous amounts of compute and uh, talent they have to build new kinds of products that are being adopted at a, a tremendous rate by the consumer space. Um, what we're seeing in the government space is a desire to build some of those capabilities, but we need to build more robust versions where it make, doesn't make a difference as much in the consumer space of if an ad is not as efficient as it could be, although obviously everyone strives to be the most uh, effective tools that they can. Uh, questions like safety, robustness are not quite as intrinsic as they are in the government space. Absolutely. I, I think another thing I would add to that is, you know, the government is trying to adopt AI technology much like their industry counterparts, but they're at a disadvantage in terms of accessing talent because of really the, the crazy amounts of money that we were able to offer talent in the industry. And so I think one of there's a couple of things that that leads to. One is that government is having to think about how do they develop their own workforce, the existing workforce, as well as create new pathways for individuals to join that workforce. They're also really having to think about what does it mean to implement AI in government and why is that different from industry so that they can start to articulate the, the skill sets that they really need to recruit. I think, you know, industry at times can be more um, ex uh, experiment, they can experiment a little bit more with who they're hiring and how they're hiring because they don't face the same level of constraints. And really, I think it's also um, a mindset shift that's needed in government today. To th and, and that pro proves a really challenging, proves to be very challenging also, that there needs to be a mindset shift from 
okay, we need to acquire exactly what is needed and we know what that is because these technologies are evolving so quickly that it's hard to say exactly what is needed. It needs to have a little bit of that experimental mindset in it. That, and that is not something that the government has done historically. And I think it's one of the challenge points today to think about is how do we move forward even when we don't have all of the answers that are accessible to us right now? And it's definitely a case where, I mean, even within industry, it's hard for them to get the talent they need. Uh, we have folks who are coming out of prestigious uh, PhD programs who are trying to figure out where do they fit in industry. Um, and just starting to move away from just the pure research portion of it and figuring out how to build these systems to uh, to scale, right? And so there becomes a desire for more engineered. The experience in software engineering is becoming more important. Um, and at the same time, it's a, what kind of research are you looking to do? Are you looking to develop new algorithms or to help systems get better? And so applying these to real world problems and real world data sets is very different than what we see in the academic world, right? It's not canned data sets that have kind of a, a well understood set of properties. It's applying these things to new data sets, new domains where we're not totally sure we have the right data to make the predictions we wanna do. So how do we start building the systems to make that happen? Absolutely, which is forcing people to step into ambiguity and complexity, and it's really hard to do that. It's also really hard to find the right people who are willing to take those steps and start answering those hard questions, particularly in the government space, where then you're also constrained by where and how data and systems exist, where, where information is stored and how you get access to them. So that brings us to this point uh, that we'll go to next on many of the organizations that we work with today are seeking guidance on exactly how to develop that workforce. We talked about a little bit about, yeah, it can be a struggle to, to bring talent in. And so when it comes to hiring or recruiting candidates, what kinds of skills, traits, experiences should hiring managers be looking for uh, as they're trying to think about growing their AI workforce today? I think that a little bit depends on where they are in the journey, right? In some places, you're going to have people who are starting out, they have um, a large set of data that they've been collecting over the years. They've been doing analytics against it for their business metrics, but they're now trying to start figuring out how do they want to start making predictions off of it? How can AI help them start solving their business problems? In that case, they're in the, the beginning phases where it may be they're building a small team, which needs to have a little bit more flexibility. You have some more blending of the roles. You're gonna want someone who can help with both like the data extraction of finding out what's the right data they need to use to solve the problem. A data scientist and data analyst may be kind of blended in the roles of someone needs to go over the data to really understand it and then start applying what's the right set of hypotheses we're gonna test, what's the right kind of experience we need to do, in order to start building the predictions we're trying to do to meet the goals of the business. Um, other organizations are in the places where they've started rolling out these systems, right? And they're, they're already starting to build um, predictive pipelines. They're using it in the business, but they're trying to figure out how to apply it more and more. And then the roles become a little bit more defined where people need to get a little bit deeper in their skills. So you're gonna have data engineers who are gonna be experts in how to move the data from the different sources around the, the enterprise to the destinations they need for uh, building these better systems. You're going to have data analysts who are going to need more domain knowledge and really understand what's the business trying to do, what's the end goal they're trying to achieve, and data scientists who can really take that input, understand the business, and then really figure out what's the right level of um, theory that can be applied to this. Is it we can rely on existing papers, existing material that's already out there, or do we have to really push new domains and really figure out what needs to happen to solve these types of problems. And then finally, getting that in production, right? So you're gonna start building uh, pipelines to actually build these things and then move them into a production setting where users can actually access them. And that could be, you know, building a uh, app for a phone where the ML system's gonna exist on an endpoint on everyone's devices or a service which is in the cloud where it will be accessed via an API. I want to go back to something you said at the, at the start of that around blended roles. So, you know, I think a lot of our, our customers, as well as a lot of the organizations we work with, are at those early stages of starting to think about, okay, I want to do some work with AI. I want to start growing my teams. And yeah, that they're going to be resource limited and need people who can wear multiple hats. 
Do you have any kind of strategies or practices you've seen work in terms of finding people who can have more fluidity in their roles? Any, any things that kind of people should think about? I've always found that the, 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 the attribute that kind of helps people do this is a sense of curiosity, of uh, really wanting to dig in to understand what's going on around them. It, it, it's not, there is a time and a place for people who can do very deep thinking and really focus down and just have the blinders on and focus on a problem and really get to great results by, by diving deep. But in those early days, it's sometimes uh, more helpful to have a little bit more curiosity, a little bit of willingness to try things that are outside their, you know, traditional bounds to really figure things out. Um, you see this a lot in startup land where people are coming in and as the business is growing and they're trying to develop it, they have to build the infrastructure they need as they go. And so you end up having to wear a lot of hats and then taking on a lot of roles. And the way that it's best to get through that is being able to ask questions, to be curious, to be able to go out and read things or talk to people and ask questions about why is this happening or what should I do um, to understand kind of what are the practices that are out there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think one of the things I've seen is from the organizational side is then being willing to also be curious in your interviewing about people who have more varied backgrounds. You know, I think especially with emerging technologies today, there's kind of great articles that, that laugh at people saying like, we want someone with four years of experience generating TikTok videos. And TikTok's only been around for a year and a half, so that would never happen. And instead trying to look at, okay, what if, even if people have experiences that look like they don't necessarily all fit together, in many ways, that can be a great sign that someone's able to jump between different fields, domains, ask those questions that you're describing, but also be that person who can start to translate. I think in small teams, one of the challenges is, you know, if you have people with deep domain expertise, they hit a barrier in terms of just language. The way that a data scientist talks about something is really different than an engineer, is really different than a user experience researcher. And you need to have people in those small teams who are focused and can serve the role of, of translating across, across those different roles. And, and even that extends to across kind of the, the journey of where they are in the AI development pipeline that you described of making sure you have that at all stages, else you can become really siloed in your organization and not actually have a holistic viewpoint on the implementation side of AI systems. Absolutely. I think that that ability to carry conversations across different types of audiences is super critical, especially in the early days. As you know, everyone's trying to understand how does this work together? They each are going to come into it with different concerns, different perspectives. And so being able to bridge that is going to be super critical being able to talk to the business people about what the problems are and explain to them what the limits are about the technology you're using is going to be just as critical as being able to talk to the engineering teams about, you know, what are the, the trade-offs? What are the um, computational costs for doing this work? So you can understand, you know, how fast or how hard you can scale these systems. Absolutely. And I, I think, uh, you know, in our current work, Jay and I are both working to help define this field of AI engineering. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail a little bit later, but it's a field that's focused on the implementation of AI systems and really thinking about how do we leverage AI towards mission outcomes. And in that space, you know, you realize that though we have different expertise, the lines are so blurred in terms of implementation, that you actually can't get to implementation unless you as the data engineer are also focused on the user experience or also focused on the infrastructure elements because one they're also tightly these elements are also tightly connected that you really need to be paying attention to them simultaneously it's all still in the place where it's artesian right and so we're not in a place where there's well defined processes although we're working on getting better at that but as people are exploring our learning you really need to be able to cross the boundaries and talk to each other about what's going on to understand where are the um, the bottlenecks or the stumbling blocks in the system so that you can work together to achieve the goal that you're going for. Absolutely. And, and I think uh, this, the, the last thing I'll add on this is I'll build on your curiosity comment with also humility that I think that we're in a space that's changing so quickly that people posturing as though they have all the answers really is a stopping point for a team because they, the problems are changing every day. The answers are changing every day. There's always new techniques being rolled out. And as you're thinking about kind of who you're bringing in to do this work, it has to be people 
who are both comfortable enough to say, I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to give my best guess today to move us forward, as well as people who are humble enough to say, you know, I don't actually know what else can I do to bring in fresh knowledge to refine my thinking and to push our, us forward a little bit. So on that, I'm going to turn us a little bit to focus on the talent that already exists in organizations. You know, I think AI has come through and many organizations are looking for rapid adoption, but don't necessarily have the bandwidth to hire, especially in light of the pandemic. And so they're looking at how do we grow our internal AI talent? What do you think organizations should consider as they look to develop their existing workforce in AI? I think it's a mix of things. I mean, the, the plus side of the explosion of AI um, capability growth is that there's been a ton of resources out there for people to learn, right? So there are Coursera courses, there are online universities, there are more and more academic institutions who are kind of opening up their doors to give people opportunities to learn about this. Um, in my uh, education path, I think that the hardest thing I struggled with is trying to figure out what are relevant uh, data sets to work with, or what are the right kind of uh, problems that I should start working on. Um, I think within a context of a business, it's a little bit easier to say, looking at the data that you have, what do you already capture about your customers or about your processes that you want to start making predictions on? The, the kind of key to think about AI is it's a prediction game. How can you help the computer guess better, right? And so looking at the things that you could, if you could have better predictions on, or you could take the predictions away from like making someone think about that to have a machine do it for them, to make them more efficient is the great place to get started. So looking at a business problem, what is the, the, the concern you're trying to go for, then finding some data that supports that and then trying to apply things that are available online is a great way to get started. Absolutely. And I'm curious, you know, I, I loved how you thought it reflected on your own journey of saying, you know, it's about figuring out the right questions to ask. Did you have any formative experiences that helped you get into this mindset of, you know, how am I figuring out the, the next thing I need to know in order to move forward? Or do you think that was something that was more, more natural to just how, how you approach problem spaces in general? Um, that's a good question. I've been at it for kind of a while. So it's a little bit of a mix. I mean, um, through my career, I've kind of watched different waves of technology go through. When I was getting started, I was in time for like catching the web. Uh, you know, I was w using the Mozilla tools before they were Mozilla. Um, and so I got to watch the web kind of go through this technology. And I got to learn across the, the path there of, you know, what does it take to, to be good at a new domain? Um, and then mobile came through and other things came through. And it's been kind of always a let's ask the question, let's try and build something, let's build a little small project to see what we learn from it. And, and for me, it's always a little bit of how do I apply some kind of new trick or, or something I want to learn, find a project that helps me explore it and understand what, what makes it hard. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think I was in a similar space of just being thrown into different domains. I had worked in healthcare, then I switched into climate science work, then I switched into innovation work. And it was all about, yeah, figuring out how do you step in and just start with something, even if it looks really small, yeah. you just in doing a bit of applied work, you know, you can, you can study for forever, but until you're actually applying those skills and knowledge that you have, you're not taking it in and figuring out, okay, what's working, what's not. And that experimental mindset, I think is so key to it of just saying, I don't know everything, but I'm a learner. And, and that's what I was gonna add to this notion of kind of developing internal talent. I think more and more, we're going to see that it's really about learning how to learn and helping people learn how to learn. I, I like to think about this in the education spaces. It's moving from, as an instructor, you have to move from being uh, sage on the stage and delivering all the information that one could ever need through a textbook or through lectures and to instead shifting to be the guide on the side. So as a manager, you know, if you're trying to in develop internal talent, you need to be thinking about how am I creating opportunities for people to learn and grow? And am I there and present when they have questions about where they go next? How do I guide them along the way, helping them see things they hadn't previously seen, ask new questions or curate a set of resources like you described, there's so many out there that the, could be the just-in-time knowledge they need to kind of push their understanding forward. So the next thing I want to kind of have us talk a little bit about is uh, the 
NSCAI in its final report, they set a really ambitious goal for the Department of Defense and Intelligence community to be AI ready by 2025. What do you think needs to change uh, for that to happen in areas such as kind of education, recruitment, workforce development? Any kind of big factors that you see as, as needing to change there? I think, you know, to, to date, the government has done a lot of work of like, you, they have a very strict process uh, of like, you have to meet these requirements, right? It, they are used to very cookie cutter type of role uh, descriptions. And I think we talked about earlier, you, you need a little bit more of the people who are able to blend things and really to go across domains and kind of pick from different experiences to uh, put together better holes. I think when I think about AI, it's a lot of learning by example. And so you want to have a diverse set of people to help you look at different examples and to bring different lenses to the problems so that they can pick better sets of examples to train the AI on, right? The, the robustness of the system comes from lots of different perspectives and data. And so having people who come from different backgrounds who can talk to different aspects of the problem can help you choose better data sets. Absolutely. I think something else I would add to that that I see needing to change is really thinking about where and how we're sourcing talent. You know, I think there's an assumption that talent in the AI space is only coming from a couple of schools. And in fact, that's really not the case. And if we can take a broader view of the skill sets that are needed, as you described, we can start to look elsewhere of what's happening at all types of schools in liberal arts colleges, at you know, really tier one research institutions? How do we start to piece together like a puzzle the talent that we need to grow and develop these systems? And I think that will also help the second piece of the diversity that's needed to really implement these systems. You know, the DOD has a strong point of view of what it means to implement ethical AI. And those are big, hard questions. They are questions that can't be solved by a single discipline. And really moving forward, we're gonna need both the diversity in terms of perspectives, you know, which is informed by the cultures people come from, their past experiences, the ways that they see problems and think about the world, as well as diversity and heuristics of ways people solve problems. You know, you can have a really diverse group of people, but if you're all engineers, you're all gonna approach that problem space in the same way. So what is it to partner a philosopher with a policymaker, with an engineer to think about and triangulate around these systems in a different way. I certainly saw that in the climate science space be incredibly important because it couldn't, you needed all of those perspectives to push each other's thinking as a means of driving towards solutions that could actually be implementable. It's really interesting, like right now, as we talk about like where the roles are, we kind of have an idea of like, there are, you know, data scientists, data engineers, and, you know, a couple of handful of roles, which are kind of what we think of what we need for AI systems. Um, but that's also going to evolve. And as part of this explosion of, of growth, we're going to see new roles develop and new things we're going to need. You know, in the, be the beginning of the web, there was always like there was a webmaster and a company would hire a webmaster and that would take care of their entire web presence, everything from hosting all the way through graphics. Uh, today, it's a... There are teams and teams of people working on web uh, products, right? You have people working on the UX side, you have um, DevOps, you have engineers, you have product specialists, you have kind of a range of different roles that didn't exist you know, 20 years ago, and now there's like an explosion of them. We're at the beginning of that explosion for AI, right? We have a couple of roles, we know that there's a data scientist, we know that there's gonna be you know, data engineers, but we don't fully realize what the older roles are gonna be. And so, you know, bringing in more perspectives is also going to be a place of we're going to need to have different um, understandings of the pieces of the work as they come together. And so that as we start building these things, we'll need more, um, more than just diversity to talk about it, but like kind of this mix of things that, that's still kind of happening. I, I agree. I think it's something I know that we've talked about before is the creativity that's needed and how you're terming roles and what you're writing in terms of job descriptions is, you know, there, we, were, we were discussing that uh, there's a role uh, available right now focused on the intersection of machine learning and user experience research. 
And that same role can be called many different things at many different companies because it's trying to articulate the mix of skill sets that's needed to push this work forward. I think that's going to be a growing challenge too, is both for the job seeker to think about, okay, where and how do I fit in? Can I find language that matches to or maps to this kind of mix of skill sets that I have, as well as for the, the organization that's looking to hire, you know, how am I bringing in people that, yeah, can, can f have a perspective on multiple different aspects of the system a as a whole? Yeah, moving away from, and it, it's difficult, right? But like, we're used to very used to kind of a checklist driven hiring process. All right, you have X years with this, you have Y years of that. And you, you know, you have these buzzwords on your resume. We're going to move into a space where it's just like, it's going to be a little bit more complex than that. And it's going to be more on, I hate to call them soft skills, but the personal skills of being able to communicate and collaborate to kind of bring these systems together. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we're going to see a, you know, there's been so many studies, the World Economic Forum has a great study on the top skills that are needed by 2030. The top of the list is complex problem solving and next to it is the ability to work with other people, <laughs> ability to work in diverse teams. And I think that hits home so strongly, which then speaking about trends, I'm hoping that over time we're going to see a shift in education, especially technical education, to be a little bit less of you know, that we need to hit all of these, you need to go through six math classes in order to be credentialed in that way and really push for these classes that are honing people's professional skill sets so that they can exist in teams, be comfortable with ambiguity and figure out how do you move forward even as things are changing at a very rapid rate. So that brings us to kind of the work that we're doing that I've hyped up so far in our conversation about AI engineering. And so AI engineering, as we term it today, is a field of research and practice that integrates the principles of software engineering systems, computer science, and human-centered design to operationalize AI systems in accordance with human needs for mission outcomes. And here at the SEI, we are home to a national initiative aimed at establishing and growing this discipline of AI engineering. And so I'm curious just from your perspective, or I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit about why you think AI engineering is necessary to grow as a discipline. So I like kind of jumping between lanes for different technologies, but one of the things I look at is kind of, uh, if we look at a mature technology like uh, automotive engineering, right? Everyone's got a car now and they're fairly well understood systems. We still see incremental improvements. It's not that they've, We've hit the final car and it's good, but it's come a long way from where it started. The original cars were made out of wood. They were highly unsafe. In order to operate them, you really had to be a mechanic. You couldn't just rely on the, the reliability of the system. You had to know it inside and out. You had to be able to disassemble your engine, reassemble the entire car from scratch. And those were kind of the, the operating parameters that were necessary to make those systems work. In AI, we're in that space right now. We need to have data scientists and engineers who kind of really take these bespoke pieces, really craft them to very specific outcomes and endlessly tune them. What we want to get to is a place where we can build more robust systems to have good principles, to have safe at any speed type AI systems that can be used in a variety of different environments. In order to get there, we need to come up with the best practices to really understand them and share them. Right now, as an industry, we've got them coming up in different places and every uh, environment, which is kind of building AI at scale, has developed their own best practices of how to work in their environment. And they're starting to share those, but it means that you have to look like their environment to be successful. And that's not always possible for everybody. So what we're going to go into for AI engineering is really What's the best practices that we can share amongst us? How do we build a set of practices and standards that help us build better tools, better technology, and, and kind of grow the profession so that we can build these uh, a more robust, safe AI systems that we can use in more places? Yeah, absolutely. So someone it makes me think of a quote I heard once is someone was describing uh, implementing new projects and they said, there's no book of spells, there's just magic. And as much as I love that, it, it really, I think, is, is not what's helpful right now, where we don't want to think about AI as magic, that there, there actually is a series of steps that are needed to build systems that are human-centered, that are robust and secure, that are scalable. And to the extent we can distill 
what exactly goes into that book of spells? <laughs> what is all of those different elements? One, we can get more people doing AI in a way that's rigorous, in a way that adheres to the values that you know, certainly the DOD holds as well as other government partners, as well as getting more people who may or may not think that they're capable of participating in the AI conversation to do so. If we can distill it, we can lower uh, fear factor about, you know, I can't talk about AI, you have to be a genius to talk about it. And I think that that becomes a big barrier. We need domain experts who know a lot about human resources systems or healthcare systems to be able to be working with AI developer system developers so that we can grow implementation and that we can make sure it's done in a way that actually reaches the potential that AI has else we're going to be like many other technologies developing these things and you know crossing our fingers hoping people adopt them but they won't actually achieve the potential that they have yeah I think the the, the beautiful potential of AI is that it, it's one of those transformative technologies that can help us in so many different ways, but it can't do that if it's just bound up with a few people. And like to your, your point of wizards and spells, it can't be the wizard on the mountain in the tower that's just casting these amazing magical things. It's got to be a part of everyday life. It's got to be something that people have as something that's accessible that they can use on a daily basis and kind of find and understand in a way that helps them make it effective. And that means making the tools available to everyone, which requires better sets of tooling. It used to be like computers were, you know, built in warehouses and only uh, accessible by a few people or a few universities. And we moved to a place where everyone has one on their phone, right? And they can use them and make them more effective in their lives. We want AI to do the same. In order to do that, we need to be able to scale the technology, build it more robustly and securely, and make sure that people really have the ability to work with it and make it accessible. Agreed. So, so on that note of, you know, giving people the resources that they need, if I'm an organization seeking to develop my AI workforce, are there any resources that you would recommend to, to watch, to listen, or to, to where to go to learn more? Um, I've been a fan of the Coursera courses. I think they've done a wonderful job of giving you a good introduction. While they include the math in there, they also tell you which parts are optional, which parts are not. So they give you a chance to kind of run through it, build examples and do things. Um, I found the Twimmel AI podcast to be super helpful to understand what's happening in the industry and get expert opinions talking about, you know, what they're doing, what they find is relevant work and, you know, where it fits in the context of the world of, what we're doing today. And that it branches from like what's in academia all the way through to like what's the latest things in industry. I would definitely second your recommendation for some of the Coursera courses. Andrew Ng's AI for Everyone is a great starting point to build literacy amongst non-technical audiences, which I think is so important if we're gonna actually enable these AI systems. And the other thing that we're doing that I think, you know, everybody in this nascent field of AI engineering should be doing is going out and talking to people. We're in a conversation mode right now, talking to our partners about where do good examples of AI systems exist? What should we be looking to? Who should we be learning from? And I think even as people who are involved in growing this discipline of AI engineering, being disciplined about going and having those conversations, learning from our partners, making sure we're tracking the state of the art is so important so that we stay as a learning organization as well and are making sure we're pushing our thinking. And so that's less of a recommendation for a resource, but more of an action that I think trying to solve all or answer all of the questions yourselves in this emergent field is too difficult. And I think that it's something that we're really trying to embody in our work also is making sure that we're learning from our peers who are doing amazing work in this space as well. I mean, I think it's the cool part of where we are right now is everybody has questions. No one has that like, we've solved it, it's good, AI is done. Everyone's happy to have the conversation because everyone needs to learn and everyone knows that there's more out there that they could be learning about and having those discussions helps everyone. I definitely agree. Well, thank you so much for being here today, Jay, to talk with me about the AI workforce. And to our listeners, thank you for being along for the journey as well. Hopefully this podcast was helpful for you to think a little bit about how to grow a the AI workforce in your own organization, or just things you need to think about as you're trying to grow AI projects uh, in specific domains. We will include links in our transcript to all resources mentioned in this podcast. And as always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you so much.
Thanks for joining us. This episode is available where you download podcasts, including SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. It is also available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and the SEI's YouTube channel. This copyrighted work is made available through the Software Engineering Institute, a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. For more information about the SEI and this work, please visit www.sei.cmu.edu. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.